So we're so appreciative for our dream team. Amen. Also, if you got a birthday this month in December, would you wave at me? I decree and declare this will be the greatest year of your life that you have lived yet. Every year you've wasted before now, you're going to make up for it in this year of your life. In Jesus' name. Somebody say, I received that. Hey, listen, also, I told you about the Christmas tour donations, so don't forget you got until Wednesday night to do that. Now, Wednesday night lives totally change in the new year. It's going to be totally different. And so uh, somebody says it's going to be different. So there's only a few more of them left. And so you want to make sure that you are here every Wednesday. The anointing is going to be strong. This past Wednesday, wasn't it powerful if you were here? Wednesday before that, a night of healing. So there's only a few more of them left, so make sure you avail yourself to that. And, of course, don't forget next Sunday is Christmas, 9, 15, 11, 15. We're giving gifts and so many other things. It's going to be a great and awesome day. You want to make sure, bring all your family that's coming in out of town. Bring your relatives that's coming out of town. There is a difference. Bring, bring them all uh, to church next week. Don't let them stay in your house and not come to church. So they say, I'm just going to stay with you cuz. Okay, well, we go to church here. Well, I don't really feel like it. Okay, well, I tell you what, well, you got to leave until I get back. In fact, why don't you just go on over Gertrude and them house anyhow and don't, don't stay here? Because if you're going to disrespect my God like that, I don't know that I want you up here eating my cornflakes. You ain't going to be eating my Fruit Loops and Frosted Flakes and not, and not going to church. Mm -mm. No, oof or no. Miss, if that's mean, no, you're letting a sleeper cell in your house. You got to be careful. Everybody carries spirits. Got it? Spirits in its simplest form in Greek and Hebrew is a mindset. So when you let people stay in your house, but they don't honor your God, you're inviting the spirit of dishonor in your house, which is bringing a season of negativity over your life. Read about it in Acts chapter 26. All right. Y'all ready for the word today? I don't know which direction I'm going to go. We're going to see by the time we get done praying. Lift your Bible or stand with me and lift your Bibles high. Let's make our confession of faith together. I am unconditionally loved by God and that harvest. I come to God as I am, and I won't stay as I am because the life-giving message I'll receive will make me more like the great I am. I'm on 10, and I win in Jesus' name. Reach out, grab the hand of the person next to you. Father, we speak life now into the hand that we hold. We speak shalom now into the hand that we hold. That is, nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking, and we declare that all is well. We declare that no weapon that has formed against them would prosper in every tongue. That rises in judgment. Father, we thank you that it is condemned. Father, we believe that you have set them to be on 10. That means experiencing the best of the best people, places, things, and ideas. And Father, we thank you now that you have used their worst to get them to their best. You've used the worst people, places, things, and ideas to get them to the best version of themselves. We decree and declare that they're not the same them they were when they started this year, but they're better. They're wiser. They're smarter. They've got more patience. They've got more compassion. They've got more love. We declare they are the best version of themselves that they have ever been. In the name of Jesus, we decree and declare, Father, that lack would not be their portion. That stress, strain, and struggle would not be their portion. That walking in fear would not be their portion. But we declare that they would rise up. Why? Because now is the time for the saints of the Most High God to rise up and to possess the kingdom. Your kingdom is who you said we could be and what you said we could have. We speak scripture. Squeeze that hand. We speak it into their lives. Thank you that they're a miracle. We saw a miracle today. We're holding the hand of a miracle today. Because after all the hell they've been through, they should have lost their mind. But they're still here. And they're still standing. And we thank you that their best is not to come. But we speak it into existence that their best is here. In the name of Jesus. If you believe that, drop those hands and give him praise. Oh, come on, life and death are in the power of the tongue. You just decreed some great stuff for your neighbor. Hallelujah. I, I, I want you to go to 3 John 1, 2. 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 I'm actually going to go the same place we were at the 915. Hallelujah. Uh, 3 John 1, 2. Say so there's something. God's about to say, I need to hear more clearly. Right, but beloved, beloved, I pray that you may prosper. In how many things? All things. Now, now, look at me, church. In 17, you are not going to have, hear me, any area of your life where it is not doing well. Not just because we said it, 
but because now we're taking the steps to put practical things in place so that we can see it. Lay your hands on yourself. Say, in 17, all things will be good with me. That, that's not how you say it. That's not how you say it. Lay your hands on yourself. Say, in 17, all things, every area of my life will be wonderful. I'm going to tell you how to get there. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in how many things? All. Talk to me, 11 15, in how many things? All. And that you'd be in health or be healthy. Watch this. Just as or equal to as your soul prospers, which means this, your reality can only match your mentality. So what's going to make 17 different is that through the last couple of weeks of this year, we are going to correct your mentality so that you can correct your reality. Say, my mentality is being corrected so my reality can be corrected. You ain't talking to me like you mean it. Say, my mentality needs to be checked so my reality can be checked. Now, beloved, I pray that you may prosper. That word prosper in Greek means that you'd have success in your money. Specifically, it means to have success in business and finance. Say, it's not God's will for me to be broke, for me to have lack. Whoever told you that is a liar and can't read. <laughs> Beloved, I pray that you may prosper. I have success in business and finance. That word in Greek, prosper, it means to be profitable. It means to be on the right path. And how many things? Okay. Now just make a circle. Uh, say, everything about my life. Uh -huh. God says, I want your family good, your kids good, your marriage good, your money good. Every single area of your life, I want you to have success. Be on the right path and for it to be profitable. And how many things? All things. And then he says, but then I want you to be healthy too. He said, because what good, what good is any of that if you're not healthy enough to enjoy it? Lay your hands on yourself. Say, I do not have time to be sick. I do not have time to be ill. It's a waste of my time. Here it is, just as what? Your soul prospers, which means your logic is your lid. You are held, watch this, I'm going to give you this, this I'm going to say it like this, and then we're going to get into the word, watch this. Your mentality is the extent of your captivity. Your mentality is the extent of your captivity. You want a better life? Get a better mindset. And say it starts right now. Father, speak to us now over these next few moments. Taylor, make customize this word for us, your people. Make it be like that you've had cameras in folks' houses all this week. Speak to us with great clarity. Speak to us with great power that we would move in those things that you have ordained. And it is that we would end 2016 strong. We're going to end this year strong, so we start the next year strong. And we thank you that it is so. In Jesus' name, somebody ha a shout hallelujah. As you take your seats, have five, two or three people tell them money matters more than you think. Money matters more than you think. Uh, this month, we began the message series called The Misrepresentation of Jesus to get the facts about Jesus and Christianity and even dive into some taboo topics to see the real Jesus so that we can see the real us. We asked people this week what they thought the Bible talked about most. And some said relationships, some people said love, some people said sex, some people said faith. But coming in with over 2,300 verses, scholars say one of the top subjects that the Bible mentions is money. Somebody say money. Money, 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 money. Maybe that ain't your generation. Mo money, mo money, mo money. The Bible talks about most uh, out of any subject is money. More than prayer, more than faith, more than heaven or hell combined. And in fact, over 15% of Jesus' words were about money. More than heaven and hell combined. Which makes it foolish to think that preaching about money in church is taboo or inappropriate. Somebody say that makes no sense. In fact, the enemy would love it that we don't talk about money in church, so then that way the church isn't empowered to be everything that God has ordained for it to be. But the devil is a lie and his mama and them are too. You ought to touch your neighbor and say, we got to talk about it, got to talk about it. People sometimes think that it's inappropriate or taboo to talk about money in church because of what they've been taught or sometimes because they're suspect of the pastor's motive. So as your pastor, let me be clear that my motive is that I don't want anyone in our church in lack because their mentality is whack. 
Whack is an urban colloquialism, which just means that it is lacking the appropriate level of erudite uh, understanding. What does that mean, Bishop? It just means you don't know what you're talking about. I don't want anybody to be in lack because they don't know what they're talking about because their mentality is whack, which explains why John 3, 1, 2 says that you can only prosper to the level that your soul prospers. What is your soul? Your mind, thoughts, will, and emotions. Say my mind, my thoughts, my will, my emotions. Check it out. You can't go any higher than your soul. The problem is most people want to glitter on the outside and rot on the inside. Most people want to bling bling on the outside but have nothing but messed up stuff on the inside. But you, let me tell you who you are. You are the interruption to the dysfunction in your bloodline. You are the curse breaker in your bloodline. You are the one that was sent to not to declare poverty would not be your portion. Lack would not be your portion. Genesis 12 says that he's blessed us to be a blessing. Well, how are you going to be a blessing and you can't help yourself? Are y'all here? Now, watch this. This brings you to the first point. Your money management reveals your mentality. Say, my money management reveals my mentality. Matthew 6, 21. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus is the anthropos, the God man. So much God, you can't believe he's man. So much man, you can't believe he's God. He is 100% God while simultaneously being 100% man. It's a very interesting uh, paradox, if you will, because how can it be 100% man, a man that is driven by his emotions and be 100% spiritual, which is driven typically uh, by the principles and the precepts of God's word? How is it that he could do both of these things at the same time? Touch your neighbor and say, my God is bad. My God is bad. And when I say bad, I mean it in a good way. Yes, watch this. Jesus said this, Matthew 6, 21. Uh, For where your treasure is, treasure in the Greek language of our New Testament means money. There your heart or your mind will be also. In other words, your money is a revealer. Say my money is a revealer. Jesus said he know what dominates our minds because of what we do with our money. And he know what's really important to us because of what we do with our money. Now, too many too many people separate their money from the most high, but they're not separate. They're like hand and glove, hogging and, bin and, crispy and, Laverne and, Martin and, Gina. Some of y'all know about that. All right. Living in color. <laughs> money is a revealer of what's important to you. Let me ask you a question. What does your money say matters to you most? For some people, your money says food matters to you most. It's quiet in the church. For some of you, your hair care matters to you most. For, okay, it got real quiet there. For some of you, your skin care matters to you most. For some of you, uh, loyalty to disloyal people matters to you most. Why? You always buying disloyal people stuff trying to buy their loyalty. Okay, y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. All right, what does your money say matters to you most? Jesus says, wherever your money is, that's where your mind is also. So let me ask you something. What does your money reveal is on your mind? It's quiet. Say, what does my money reveal about my mind? Here's the reality. Most of us don't know how to answer that question because we don't even track our money because you weren't taught how to properly manage money. You were taught when you get paid, just go spend it. You were taught that credit means it's free money. So when them people came to you on college campus and like, we got a credit card offer, you were like, free money, there we go, whoop, there it is. And then all of a sudden you started getting letters from TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian talking about somebody said you ain't paid them. And you got trouble, trouble, trouble. Now, here's the deal. Here's what a lot of people say. I just need to make more money. And let me tell you, you are wrong. So wrong. Why, Bishop? Because if you mismanage the money you have, why do you need more money to mismanage? You don't need more money if you mismanage the money you have. You just need to manage what you have better. Let me ask you a question. Where's your budget? Okay, it got real quiet right there because Christian people just want to put some oil on it and say, Jesus, do it. Jesus says, listen, no, what you do with your money tells me what's on your mind. So watch this. You want me to give you more of it, but what I've given you, you don't even manage it well. That's why there's so many parables in the scripture, which are stories to illustrate principles. There's so many parables about stewardship. Stewardship is management. See, the money you have, I need to let you in on the secret, isn't your money. The scripture says that it belongs to God. It, the money you have, you're simply giving management over. So how good of a job are you doing at managing what you have? Where's your budget? Or do you treat what you have like it's the best? Or are you constantly wanting other stuff? Man, if I had a new car, I'd do this. No, you wouldn't. You don't take care of your hoopty. 
Let me tell you something. If you can't treat your hoopty like it's the top of the line, when you get to the top of the line, you'll be complaining about it. Watch this. If I just had another spouse. Listen, if you can't treat what you got better, you wouldn't treat somebody. Y'all not saying nothing. Somebody else better. If I had a bigger house, if you can't keep your two-bedroom apartment clean, what in the world are you asking for a house for? Well, I'd keep it clean. No, you wouldn't because your money reveals your mindset. You're sloppy and you're lazy. Your money revealed that. Oh, but you ought to touch your neighbor and say, you don't have a clue who you sit next to. I think there are some people that say, I may have managed my money carelessly before, but from this day forward, I'm going to manage my money because it teaches Jesus what's on my mind. Somebody say, I'm a good money manager. Where's your budget? You know, we have a book on the subject that's full of God's principle about maximizing your money, called getting your finances in order. And it's amazing to see the money prayer requests that come in juxtaposed to how many people have read the book and applied the principles in the book. Now, let me be clear. It's not to sell books. It's to birth some blessed people. And if you want to see your money situation change, you're going to have to change your what? Mentality. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right, which brings me to my second point. Money answers everything but isn't everything. Money answers everything, but isn't everything. Bishop, what do you mean money answers everything? What do you mean? No, faith answers everything. You a lie. It's quiet. Love answers everything. Mm -mm. Nope. Uh, let me show you something. Let me show you something. Ecclesiastes 10, 19, which by the way, Ecclesiastes was, uh, Ecclesiastes comes from the word ecclesia, uh, ecclesia to be, uh, to be exact, which means church folk. So this book is written to church folk. And look what he says to church folk. A feast is made for laughter, and a wine makes merry. You read the last part. Come on, let me hear you, church. Now, King Solomon, who is uh, believed to be one of the wisest men to have ever lived, and consequently also one of the richest men to ever live until recent years where Bill Gates surpassed his wealth, King Solomon throws that statement in, money answers everything, on the end of the verse while he's speaking about something else. But the profundity of the statement is not diluted simply because it was thrown on at the end. Let's rewind to you getting to church this morning to see how true this statement is in your everyday lives. I did this this morning. How many of you uh, woke up this morning uh, to an alarm? Okay, so what the rest of y'all do? You just, just Jesus woke you up? You just open your eyes. You say, oh, I feel you, sweet Jesus. Thank you. Right, most of us woke up to a long time. Unless you're a morning person. And morning people, you don't need clocks to wake you up. Morning people, when you see the rooster, cock a doo doo like, wonderful day. How they did Leo? And I, lo I love morning people. You know, that's not my particular testimony, but I love morning people. I'm a midday person. That's me, Mid midday, midday. Now, here's the deal. You woke up to a clock, uh, m and most of us, it was on our phone. We transitioned, most people have transitioned from alarm clocks to cell phone clocks, okay? Most people, uh, whatever you got. Here's the point. Uh, how'd you get that phone? You got it from your phone carrier, right? All right, all right. H uh, how'd you get that phone deal? Money. How'd you get the phone? Money. How did that phone stay, uh, stay on all night? It was charging. Well, how did it charge? A cord. How'd you get the cord? Money. What's that cord plugged into? The wall. What's that wall bringing in? Power. how do you get that power to come into the house? Money. How do you know? Because don't pay the power bill. You ain't going to have no power. Some of y'all then went home and discovered that the devil was messing with the power. Y'all is in And the devil was called. You didn't pay them their money. All right. Watch this. Watch this. Check it out. Check it out. So now, so, so, so you just, just getting up, everything about that required money. Everything about that. Okay. Now, check it out. You've gotten up. Now, you were probably laying on a bed. How'd you get that bed? Money. If you didn't pay for it, if somebody gave it to you, they had to pay for it. Okay. On that bed, you probably had some sheets. Those sheets had to be paid for. Hopefully, you washed the sheets. Amen. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. And once a month it does not constitute as washing seats. And I hope you swap your pillows out so that one side don't get oily. You gotta, cause we got, so you got two pillows and then two dress pillows. You got it? And so you're supposed to swap them so four days out the week then it's washing time. Just threw that in there. They don't cover that in school anymore. So, <laughs> I'm being funny. So take this out. Take this out. Do, 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 uh, to wash those sheets, you needed a what? 
washing machine, okay, and a dryer. Unless you're from the south and you don't have dryers, you, put, you get some clothes pins and put it on the rack. But you can't do that here, especially yesterday. Your sheets would have been... <laughs> when the high is, you know, four... And the low is negative 15. You can't put your sheets out on the clothes. On the, okay? Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Those sheets have to be washed in a washing machine. How'd you get that washing machine? Money. How'd that washing machine turn on? Power. How does that power stay on? Money. Then after you wash them, oh, by the way, when you wash them, you use washing powder or gel. Either way, you have to put some soap in there. Amen. Washing soap. Now, for those of you who be cheating and taking the dish soap and putting it on in the washing machine. I'm just joking. I'm being funny. Touch your neighbor and say, laughing, church. My God, laugh. Some people come to church, they're just so. And if you're constipated, the bookstore has got a wonderful cran grape stuff in there that'll help you just. I'm just being funny. All right, check this out. So the dryer, come on, stick with me, church. So the, uh, so the washer, washing powder, all of that, you have to do that with what? Money. Put them in the dryer. That dryer costs you money. The, the dryer sheets you put in there so that it, f- it has that smell on it afterwards. You bought those with money. All right. To take them out of the dryer and, and go fold them up. Don't do all of that. Okay. Now you got all that. So we still ain't got you out the bed yet. But everything required money. Are you catching this church? All right. Now l- let's get you to the bathroom. Okay. You in the bathroom. All right. You flip on the light switch. How's that light switch come on? Power. That power is paid for with money. That switch itself, that switch itself wasn't free. Somebody had to use some money to buy that switch. Do you see so far that we only got you to the bathroom and everything required? So if everything in life requires money, then you ought to have a good mentality about it. Y'all ain't talking to me, 1115. So in the bathroom, you know, you may go take a seat on the throne. For your morning rituals. Okay? The water that's in that toilet. Uh-huh. How your water, how your water come in your house? You got to pay the water bill. How you pay the water bill? Money. Okay? The toilet itself costs money. I don't know where you're from, but I, I've never seen free toilets. Okay? All right. The toilet paper you use once you conclude your morning rituals. You had to spend some money to get it. Now, maybe you spent a little money on one ply, a little bit more money on two ply. Either way, you spent money. We haven't even got you dressed yet, and everything required money. Okay? You're at the faucet. Time to brush your teeth. Do all of that. Okay? That water, money. The faucet, money. Everything, money. The face towel you use, you have to get that with money. The soap you use to wash your face, money. When you get in the shower, that shower head costs money. That tub costs money. Everything costs money. So now, let's just get you dressed. You're in your closet now. Those shoes cost money. More money, more money. Okay? The, the jacket you put on cost money. Maybe it didn't cost you, but it cost somebody. The undergarments you put on cost money. The jewelry you put on cost money. The glasses you put on cost money. The contacts you put on cost money. Do you see the trend here? There is nothing that happens in life where money is not involved. So why is it that you think some people don't want the church talking about money? Because they realize that if the church doesn't have money and the people in the church don't have money, then we can't answer nothing. The book says money answers what? All things. Now, in your car, when you were driving your way to church this morning, got it? You turned your car on. That key costs money. That car costs money. The gas in the car costs money. The tires on the car cost money. Wow. The armor all you use to shine it up costs money. The chamois you use when you spend all day on a Saturday washing it only for it to snow Saturday night costs money. It all costs what? Money. So do you see the wisdom in Solomon's statement? Money answers what? Everything. Say everything. Money is a tool. Money is a resource, not your source. Now, this is significant because while money answers everything, say money isn't everything. What do you mean money isn't everything? See, some people, they take that to the extreme and they begin to love their money. And if you love your money, you know that you love it because every decision you make is based on getting all the money you can and canning the money you get. 
That's evidence that you love money. If the only reason you take an opportunity is because of money, you love it. Quiet in the church. If the only reason you do something is because of money, that means you love it. Now, come on, don't talk, get quiet on me. I was shouting a minute ago, don't get quiet on me now. Now, check this out. It's important to understand that Satan wants Christians poor and consequently the church poor because then we can't answer anything. Because what answers everything? Money. I know what somebody's thinking. Well, Bishop, what about people in third world countries or people this or people that or people this? The, the scripture says that Jesus said that the spirit of the Lord was upon him to preach the gospel to the poor. What's the good news? Gospel means good news. What's the good news to somebody that's poor? The good news is you don't have to be poor anymore. So God's word gives us a strategy. It gives us a way. But the reality is, is that how can you be a blessing if you can't help yourself? How can you change the community and you can't pay that? Get your oil changed. It's quiet in the church today. Say money answers everything, but isn't everything. See Matthew 6, 24, check it out. Jesus said this, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll stand by and be devoted to the one and despise and be against the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now mammon isn't money. Mammon is the love of money. And people have inaccurately said that money is the root of all evil, but it's not. Because 1 Timothy 6, 10 says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which means money has more to do with your spirituality than you ever knew it did. That's why Jesus said, I'll know what's on your mind based on what you do with your money, which means your money is really spiritual. And it's interesting because in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus, he says, you cannot serve God and mammon, which means mammon and God were placed on the same level, meaning that if you love money, you can't love God. It's quiet, church. Say, I should have money, but money shouldn't have you. Yeah, you should have money, but money shouldn't have you. And the best example of this is Jesus himself, because contrary to popular belief, Jesus wasn't poor and he had money, but it did not have him. He realized that his money was a resource for him to change the region and consequently change the world. Would you say my money is a resource? See, I think I'm preaching to some people that have graduated beyond cash, cars, and clothes and realize that the reason I've got money is it's a resource. It's a tool so I can be the change I want to see. Rather than complaining about what's going on in the world, I can just answer it with some... Y'all not saying nothing. Say, Jesus wasn't poor. In fact, Jesus did so well in business that, watch this, as a carpenter, which uh, means builder. In the Greek, it's this word tecton, which means he was a builder of things. That uh, for, At age 30, Jesus did so well, Mark 6, 3 teaches us, he was able to go into full-time ministry and hire 12 guys full-time. You can't do that unless you got some money. What's interesting about it is when Jesus was 12, his mother came and Jesus had disappeared for a little bit. They didn't know where he was. He was still in church and they had left. They left Jesus at church. Okay, you missed it. They left Jesus at church. They go about three days journey. They come back and she says, Jesus, where have you been? We've been looking for you. We, can't, we don't know where you're at. And Jesus said, woman, did you not know I must be about my father's business? So from age 12 and on, Jesus said, I'm here to handle business. I get one shot at this life. And I am not going to waste it playing little games. I know the other 12-year-olds are playing games. I'm handling business. I think of some people in here that say, I know other people are playing games. Other people are just trying to party. But I'm here to handle some business. Because when I die, it is going to matter that I lived in the first place. Would you have to have your name and say, make it matter, make it matter. So from age 12 to age 30, Jesus is building. He's working on something. He's building success. He's learning money management. So that age 30 now, he begins his ministry and he goes full time and he's able to hire 12 guys full time. And in John 1, 38 through 39, the scripture shows us that Jesus had a house. Now, most images that we have of Jesus were that he was just kind of some free-spirited guy that just kind of walked around in the middle of the day without no job laying up. It's kind of oh, just, oh, just, I'm here to heal in Jesus. No, no. Jesus had a house, which meant he had to have some money. In fact, not just money, he had to have good credit. Okay, y'all don't want to talk about it. It's quiet in the church. Y'all got super quiet there. Now, say Jesus had a house. John 138-39 suggests it was large enough that some of his early staff were able to stay with him for a little while. All right, you still with me? See, he had money. Money didn't have him because he didn't walk around saying, how you like me now? He wasn't on cribs. Gives us this TV show used to come on. 
uh, and uh, people would show you their house, and then they'd have all their cars lined up. And what they didn't tell you is that they were renting most of them. <laughs> but, but, but they had all these cars, and they had all this stuff, and, uh, and, and, and Jesus wasn't doing all that. They had to ask him. They said, teacher, tell us where you stay. He said, oh, come on, see it. They had to ask to see it. Because when, watch this, you know you don't love money when you're not trying to impress anybody with it. Only poor people try to impress other people with stuff. Look at my house, look at my car, look at my shoes, look at my this. But when you got money and money doesn't have you, you folk got to ask you about what you have. Okay, it's quiet in the church. All right, let's keep it moving. Okay, John 12, 8 says, Jesus said this, for the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have with you always. Notice he didn't include himself in that category. Say he wasn't poor, and I shouldn't be either. Y'all are not talking to me like you're reading the Bible. Say Jesus was not poor, neither should I be. Uh, that, that means you should not have lack. That means you should not be living paycheck to paycheck. That means you should not uh, have so much debt that you stressed out, losing hair, losing sleep. And if that's been your life, I came to announce to you those days are over in your life. I said those days are over in your life. High five your neighbor say those days are over in my life. Now watch this. Now, now Matthew 27, 35 and John 19, 23 teaches us that when they crucified Jesus, his clothes were so nice that once they crucified him, they cast lots to see who would get them. You don't cast lots for rags. And John says that the garment was so nice that it was, look what it says, the tunic was without seam. And if you know anything about fashion, that when there are less seams, there is more expense. That means it's a custom piece. Now, why are you telling us that, Bishop? Because it's significant to know the level of detail Jesus paid to just how he looked. Okay, let me just throw this in there for free. You can't want to own 10 life. Okay. You can't want to be the best of the best, but always present yourself as the worst of the worst. And I'm not just talking about the way you look physically or the clothes you have. Because let's just be honest. It ain't the clothes that make you. It's you that makes the clothes. But what am I trying to say to you? I'm trying to say to you, stop talking about you want to be the best, but you do nothing to improve yourself so that you present yourself as the best. And since y'all ain't going to say that, let me just do say what I want to say. And for all you single people talking about you want a king, well, you better step to him like a queen. Because Okay. You can't. All right, all right. Let me stop. I just want a king. Well, you need to stop looking like you to help. Take some pride in how you put yourself together. Make And don't do it for no other body. Don't do it for somebody else. Do it because you love you. Be the best you because you love yourself. Bishop, I'm just running to the store. Well, look good going to the store. Bishop, I just got this low-paying job. Work it well. You, you can't have, you can't have, you, you can't have a low mentality and want a great reality. You know what? Let me help somebody understand something. See, see, some people, you, you, you may have a job and, and, and maybe it's not all of the accoutrements that you like. What you didn't realize is that it was a test. And because you are sloppy in that, heaven's like, why would we give you something? You want a business? <laughs> What the heck would we do that for? You can't even be trusted to do this right. Touch your neighbor and say, give your best all the time. Oh, no, that's the wrong neighbor. Try that other and say, give your best all the time. No, if you want the best, you got to give your best. You got to bring your best. All right, let me leave that alone. Yeah, I'm going to tell it. No, 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 watch this, watch this. John 12, 6 suggests that Jesus' ministry did so well financially. Hear me. That one of his 12 leaders, key leaders, full-time job was to manage the money. Judas was the treasurer. Let me use modern vernacular. Judas was the CFO. And he was stealing. But Jesus' ministry was doing so well financially that Jesus was able to know that but still have enough to get the mission done. Now, why is it important to know that? Because most times in, in the culture and the imagery we have of Jesus was that he was walking around begging people. You think you can help me out with this healing crusade? 
Not the case. He did so well, he hired a guy whose only job was to count the money. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You don't hire a guy to count the money to count pennies. Uh, are you still here, church? Now, here, here's the last piece I want to give you. Now, remember, the principle is Jesus had money, clearly, but money didn't have him. He was on his assignment. Say, there's nothing wrong with having money, but money can't have me. See, watch this. Whenever you find your identity in money, oftentimes you have to lose it to discover that it's not you. Whenever you find your identity in good credit, often you'll have to lose it to discover it's not you. When it, watch this. Whenever you find your identity and what you drive and where you live and all that, please understand, I think there's some folk in here that just said, Bishop, I didn't had some stuff and I didn't lost some stuff and I found out I was not the stuff. That, that does, I wish I had some honest people in here. Can anybody be honest about your story to say, I done had some stuff and lost some stuff and I found out that that stuff doesn't make me. 2 Corinthians 8 9, here's what it says. Jesus had money, money didn't have him. Watch what the Bible says about him. Uh, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, though he was what? Rich. Yet for you, now rich here in Greek, the language of our New Testament has two meanings, dual meaning. It means spiritually and naturally. Say spiritually and naturally. Okay. For though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. What does that mean? On the cross, what did he give up? He gave up both his natural riches and spiritual riches. What do you mean he gave up spiritual riches? He was God, so he had to take on our sin, which means he gave up his spirituality to take on our carnality. So on that cross, he says, I'm giving it up, which is why when they came to him and they were like, we're going to kill you, Jesus. Jesus was like, let me help you understand something. You can't take my life. I have to give it. And I'm giving it. Watch this because 2,000 years later, it's going to be some people in 13 degree weather in Denver, Colorado that are going to need me. It's going to be some people that are going to need a savior. Some people that are going to need hope. Some people that are going to need a fresh start. You ain't taking my life, sucker. I'm giving it. So he had to give up his spiritual riches. And give up his natural riches. Verse, it says, yet for, come on verse, it says, yet uh, that he was rich, yet for your sakes he became what? Poor. For whose sake? My sake. Say your name. So he gave those things up, both naturally and spiritually, that through his poverty, on that moment on, Crow on Calvary, we might become what? Rich. In, in what? Spiritually and naturally. Now, don't take that out of context. I'm not telling you that God is a genie in a bottle. I'm not telling you that everybody under the sound of my voice is going to be a millionaire. Okay, so don't, don't take out of context what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is the scripture's clear. He doesn't want you in lack. My God, I don't understand why it's so hard to get, to get church, but I understand Solomon's issue, to get church people to believe this. If, if there's anything you want to, you know, people to, uh, you know, believe stuff in the Bible, like, why would you, this is good stuff. Uh, like, like, why are you fighting to believe the good stuff? Tell never said, this is the good stuff. All right, let me tell you, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Say he wants me to do well. Psalm 35, 27. It makes him happy to see you do well. It makes him happy. Psalm 35, 27. See, here's what some people were taught. You're suffering for Jesus, brother. You're just suffering for Jesus. And after all this suffering, one day, you're going to die. And in the sweet by and by, he's going to reward you for all the hell you were in. Doesn't that sound like a good plan? Which, Wednesday, which Sunday is this? Oh, I can't. Uh, no! That doesn't sound good because that's not what he promised. He promised us the kingdom, which is a lifestyle, not heaven, which is a place to live. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that's a lifestyle. Are you here? What is the kingdom? It is heaven's attributes on earth. It's when uh, heaven invades your everyday living. And it's God's MO. It's how God does the things that he does. That's why Revelation says that he made us kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Not when we die and get over there. No, we're living to bring over there down here. See, what's our purpose if all of it happens when we're not here? Okay. Verse, though, let me show you this. Psalm 35, 27. 
Let them shout for joy and be glad. Do what the Bible says. Let's try this again. Let them, that's y'all, shout for joy and be glad. <laughs> y'all looked at me like, who's them? Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, read it with me, church. Let the Lord be magnified. Read it with me real strong. Who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. What does he have pleasure in? My prosperity. Now, don't get it twisted. Prosperity is not materialism. It's not cash, cars, and clothes. Prosperity here is the Hebrew word shalom, which means nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking, all is well. Well, money's part of that. So he has pleasure in seeing you do well. Okay. Now, the antonym or the opposite of that word, uh, pleasure or, or delight, is dislike, which means he dislikes when you are not prosperous. Now, if he likes it when I do good, don't like it when I don't do good, simple choice for me. I ought to do good. Here's the trip about it, though. I control that. Say, I control that part. Uh -huh. Third John 1, 2. Remember where we were. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper, which in the Greek language of our New Testament means have success in business and finance, be profitable and be on the right path in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers, which means my reality can only go to the extent of my mentality. So if I want a better reality, what do I have to first fix? Fix. Mentality. Say, fix my mentality. Change my reality. Okay. This, this, is why, this is why, watch this. Let me, let me help some of y'all. This is why 2016 really has been a repeat for some of y'all of stuff you already went through because your mentality didn't change the first time you went through it. And God says, I'll let you go through it again until your mentality is corrected, until your mentality is fixed. Say, my mentality determines my reality. Which brings us to the third and final point, and I'm done, which is Jesus watches your giving. How is it that we access this, this doing well? How is it that we do that? Well, Jesus watches our giving. Now, in other words, how you manage your money manages to Jesus more than you think because Jesus watches what we give and how we give it. Say, so he watches what we give and how we give it. All right, let me show you this. Matthew 12, 41. Now, Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. What did he do? He saw what? How the people put the money in the treasury. It's offering time. Say it was offering time. The Bible says Jesus sits and he watches. So for everybody who says stuff like this, you have people who say this. Well, I just don't think it's about money. Yet everything in life is about money. Solomon said everything is about money. Here's what they'll say. I just, I just feel, you know, I just feel, you know, that it's just all about being a good person in your heart. And that ain't in the Bible. In fact, the Bible says your heart is filthy. So you can keep all of that stuff for somebody that can't rewrite and do arithmetic. Because we can do those three things, we know that that's not what the Bible says. Okay? Now, I just feel, I just, you know, I just feel, I guess it's about being a good person, you know, and just putting out good energy in the world, you know, and just, what? What are you talking about? And here's what they'll say. Here's what they'll say. I don't really think Jesus cares about what we do with our money. After we just learned that the number one thing the Bible talks about is money. Evidently he cares if he talked about it more than he talked about anything else. Evidently it matters. Why? Because it answers everything. There's some stuff that you, that you have to pray about that if you get your money right, you wouldn't have to. Because you'd be able to say, what? You can answer it. Okay? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay. Now, Jesus sat opposite the treasury, so he watched the offering. So for everybody who thinks, I just fell in my heart, that it doesn't really matter. It's about putting good vibes in the world and just, you know, live, you know just, just eating clean. <laughs> like, what? Eating clean? What does that have to do with the, what? It's about eating clean 
and just, you know, putting good vibes in the world. And I just don't think that God really cares about, you know, what I do with my money, you know. No, I don't. Okay. Jesus sat opposite the treasure. Here's what Jesus did. It was offering time. And everybody thought Jesus was about to, you know, go out in the back and get freshened up for the next service. When offering time, Jesus stood and he watched. He said, y'all going and pass them buckets. And then he. And he looked at how they put the money in because he watches what we give and how we give. And he says, and he saw how the people put money into the treasure and how many who were rich, how they put much in or put in much. Then one poor woman came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrant, which is really like a half a penny. So he called his disciples to himself. So he's watching the offering. And in the middle of the offering, he says, y'all come here, y'all come here, y'all come here. All 12 come around him. He says, y'all see what that woman give? And Judas is like, "Mm mm-hmm. Because Judas was trying to figure out how to sneak it out, you know. Everybody's like, yes, we do it. Jesus goes on uh, when this story is recorded in another text. And he says, I've not seen such great faith. He says, look, this poor widow woman put in more than all those that have given to the treasury. Why? Because she gave out of her lack. They gave out of their abundance. Notice what Jesus didn't say. Well, she didn't have it. So bless those that give and bless those that wanted to give. No. He said, if she wants to receive the blessing, she's going to have to give too. But for her, her sacrifice was greater than those that had more. Notice what he didn't say, church, because here's what people say. I just think God knows my heart. God knows I'm going through a rough time right now, so he knows that I steal from him every week. He understands. No, he doesn't understand. If he didn't understand this, now here's what you need to understand. As a widow, why does it tell us that she's a widow? Which means in the Hebrew culture, she had no way of making income unless she had a son. Which tells us that what this woman gave, she gave it purely out of faith. Purely out of obedience. Because the truth be told, she didn't know how she was going to get her next this or that. But because God's true to his word, she gave out of her lack, out of her poverty, and he made sure that she didn't lack. And you see this all throughout the scripture. Say, 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 what I do with my money matters to Jesus. Say, he watches my giving. So he watches what we give and how we give. Here it is. Here's how we should give faithfully. The opposite of faithful giving is casual giving, which is a failure to give faithfully uh, what God's word tells us to give and when God's word tells us to give it. And instead, it gives when it wants to, how it wants to, if it wants to, which is why everything always falls through for casual givers. Casual givers, they, you know, it, it's, like, it's like, you know, they give a little bit. But, and, and, and here's the trip about it. Here, here's the trip about it. Here's the trip about it. You wouldn't do that with anything else. Okay? You wouldn't do that with Comcast. I'm going to send you all $25 this month because that's just what I feel like giving today. Okay, and you know what they're going to do? They're going to cut your service off and keep your $25. You don't do that with Sprint. Okay, which is the equivalent of two cans and a piece of string in between. I'm just being funny. But y'all, you know. You don't do that T-Mobile. You don't do, watch this. You really don't do that with Cricket. If Cricket don't have her money, the day your bill is due, other people start answering your calls. Oh, don't y'all look at me like you don't know about the other people answering your calls because you played, you played the line real close one day. Talking about I'm trying to wait for my direct deposit to come through and you waiting, trying to time it. And Cricket's like, well, that's fine. Once you get that figured out, I'll turn you back on. We wouldn't do that with anything else. So why would we treat God that way? It's quiet in the church. Nobody goes to Wendy's and, and says, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And then when you get to the drive through and say, okay, that'll be this amount of money. Mm, I'm just not feeling it today. I've had a rough week. I got a lot going on. I, uh, I had this, I had this, I had to help Shay Shay Nan with this, I had that Ray Ray Nan with this, I had to look, look, all this, I had to do all this. I, it's rough. I am just need the meal. You know what they're going to do? Well, when you get some money, honey, you come back and see us. Until then, you're not going to short us. Question, so then why do so many Christians short the God that wakes them up? Short the, I'm not trying to beat you up. I just want you to have your best money year in 2017 than you ever had. So don't hear anything as I'm preaching his condemnation. I just want you to step into 2017 with no lack, with no stress, with no mess. That's my motive. Now, no, 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 watch this, watch this, watch this. 
faithful giving provides your living. And the number one reason when people give, it seems like it doesn't work, is because most people give casually. But for your money to be good, you must do consistently what others only do occasionally. All right, Malachi 3, 8. We're going to look at these versions, then I'm done. It says, will a man rob God? Now, that's, that's a bold man. Like, who's going to rob God? It's quiet, church. All right, yet you have robbed me. And you say, I love God, because God is like, I'm going to tell you what you said to me. After I said the question, here's what you'd say. Well, how did I rob you, God? I love God. You don't love God? And you say, in what way have you robbed me? Look at what God says. In your tithes and your offerings. In your money. Now, let me be clear here. In the Hebrew culture, when the tithe was originally instituted, uh, it was instituted not as part of the Torah. It was instituted by Abram. Abram has now ha has what's called the Abrahamic covenant. And the scripture says that after Abram had this great victory, that he gave a tithe to Melchizedek, which was a type of Jesus, king and priest. He gave a tithe to him of all that his spoils were. Now, here's what's significant about this, is, is that in the day, days of Scripture, until money was a means of exchange, they would have used what the means of exchange were, which was agriculture. So if you lived in a culture that was based off of cheese production, that would have been the means of exchange. And so that means of exchange would have constituted as money. So you wouldn't have given money, you would have given cheddar. Or provolone, or Swiss, or American. Or whatever. Or blue cheese. Preferably blue cheese. Or what's the other one? Um, feta. With some, with some candied pecans, cranberries, a nice light Italian dressing, maybe something like that. Strips of grilled chicken. Okay. I haven't eaten yet, excuse me. Now, <laughs> watch this, watch this. So look at verse 10 or verse 9. You are cursed with a curse. A curse is an empowerment to fail. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. He said, your whole family robs me. Quiet, church. Verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Storehouse represents the local church. Bring all the tithes into the what? Storehouse. What, what are the tithes? All the tithes. What's the tithe? The first 10%. So it's not the tithe if everybody else got paid first. It's a tip. It's quiet in the church. Okay. Let's preach on through it, Bishop. Bring all the tithes in the stars that there may be food in my house and try me or test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is a Hebrew idiom that means the Lord that fights for you. God says your giving makes me fight for you. If I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour you out such blessing, there will not be room enough to receive. What does blessing mean? It's an empowerment to prosper, to do well, and to be whole. So watch this. How do I get blessed? Through my giving. Did you, did you see this for yourself? Okay, because people will go around talking about, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Not if you rob God. I just got to teach you the truth. I just, just, okay, all right, watch this. Verse 11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall your vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed. You shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Here's what those verses mean. He says, I'll rebuke the devourer. Say, he rebukes the devourer. Now, maybe that's a bad financial decision. Maybe that's a, a bad relationship that would have drained you. Maybe that's preventing identity. Death. He says, whatever would come to devour, I'm going to rebuke that for you, which means when you're a faithful giver, there's stuff that never gets to you because your giving blocked it. You're not hearing what I'm saying. There's stuff that never got close enough to you because your giving was like a shield that kept it from coming to you. But watch this. He says, and nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you. He says, listen, even in your worst moments, you still going to do good. You won't lack for anything. You won't lack for eating. You won't lack. I think I got some witnesses in here that, that you maybe went through some valleys, but your giving sustains you. Is there anybody that can say, I've been through some valleys, but my giving protected me. My, my giving sustained me. Here it is. I'm almost done. The unknown curse of not faithfully giving. Here's the question. Is it worth the cost? Now, you said, Bishop, what do you mean? Because you may have people who don't tithe, and they might be doing, you think, well, financially. The, notice the scripture says that you're cursed with a curse. Now, which means wherever it will have the greatest impact and effect is the area it will hit. So maybe for somebody, it's not their finances. Maybe for somebody, it's their relationships. Maybe for somebody, it's their children. Maybe for somebody, it's their daughter. Maybe for somebody, it's their cousin. Whatever area, check it out, whatever area that is going to have the greatest and most significant impact is the area that's affected. Are you here, church? Now, so that's how we give. So that's how we give. Now, here's what we give. Nehemiah 12, clearly shows us there's four ways we give as Christians. Tithes, offerings, 
In first fruits, there's another distinction of offering that's called a love offering uh, that I'm not going to get into great detail today. Say tithes, offerings, first fruits. Tithe is the first gross 10% of every dollar earned or received. That includes everything. That's child support money, income tax refunds, unemployment, babysitting money, everything. Somebody give you $20 walking down the street? How much of that is God's? The first $2. Say the first two. Now, the tithe combined with offerings opens up the windows of heaven. The offerings, everything you give above your tithes, and rebukes are stopped to devour, and it pours you out a blessing or empowerment to prosper. Not just necessarily money itself. See, it could be ideas, opportunities, inventions, favor, wisdom, the right connections, and it rebukes the devourer for your sake. Now, we pay the tithe because Leviticus 27 says it belongs to God, but we sow the offering. Say, the tithe belongs to God, but I sow the offering. So, so watch this. The scripture refers to our offering as seed. Now think of it like you're a farmer. The more seed you sow, the more harvest you. I like that. I like, I, somebody said grow. I was going to say reap, but I like that. The more, the more seed you sow, the more harvest you grow. I like that. It rhymes. You're going to put that on the next record. <laughs> <All right. laughs> watch this. <laughs> now, now, say the more seed I sow. The more harvest I grow. Now, now here's what 2 Corinthians 9, 9 says. It says that God gives seed to the sower. Say he gives seed to the sower. Uh, which means God is looking for somebody to prosper. He's looking for somebody that can do well. And since he's looking for somebody, I don't know about you, but it might as well be me. Touch your neighbor and say, it might as well be us. See, watch this. You don't just need enough to meet your needs. No, you're blessed to be a blessing, which means you need more than what you need so you can be a blessing to other people. How can you help somebody else and you can't first help yourself? So here it is. I'm closing. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly. Now, this is in your Bible. See, because some people say, oh, I just don't believe in, in that sowing and reaping. You don't have to believe in it. I mean, you don't have to believe in gravity. Get on top of the building and jump. Your belief is inconsequential to whether or not it works. But this I say, he who sows what? Sparingly. Say a little bit. They're going to reap what? Sparingly. Now, he's not talking about the tithe because that was understood. He said, this is related to your offering. He says, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap what? Bountifully. So it says, little seed, little harvest. Got it? Bigger seed. Now, just do this. Say big harvest. big harvest. Say for my life. That's what the book says. Verse, uh, verse 7, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Watch what it says. It says this. It says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart or mind. Watch the connection. Remember, your mentality is the extent that you can have in your reality. So with your offering, he says, listen, you've got to have a generous mentality. You missed it. So that you can have a fruitful reality. Then he says, not grudgingly nor necessity for God. Looks how he tells you how to do it. He says he loves a cheerful giver. I don't know about you, but giving to God is one of the most exciting parts of my week. I smile. I'm excited because I don't have to give. I get to give. Is there any witnesses in here where God has been very good to you? Man, I'll just say, go by myself. God has been very good to me. He's been good to your neighbor. In fact, he's been good to everybody on your road, which means I get to give to him. I'm not doing him a favor. It's my pleasure. It's my privilege. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. Don't anybody tell you they love you and they never give you anything. Watch this. Now, 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 look what he says. Uh, verse 8. And God. Who? And bishop, no. And your boss, no. And your supervisor, no. And the credit card company, no. And who? God is able to make all grace. Grace is the word favor. It is when God adds his super to your natural. And God is to make all, so let's call it what it is, favor. What's favor, bishop? Preferential treatment. See, they'll say, well, we don't do this for everybody, but for you? Your giving is the catalyst that makes that happen. Verse. And God is able to make all grace abound or turn toward, say your name. That, say your name. Always having all sufficiency in how many things? All things. Which means God says your giving is what gets every area of your life together. Why, Bishop? 
because it's not just about the money because it's revealing where your heart is when God is first in your giving it reveals that he's first in your heart first in your mind first in your mentality verse it says always having what all sufficiency in what all things may have an abundance for every good work now now that's not how you read that verse when this is your verse and God is able to make all what favor turn toward say your name say it like you mean it say your name that say your name always having which means God says I don't ever want to see you in lack no more all sufficiency watch this not just in your money but in all things and God says I want you to have an abundance for it would you just declare over your life say my days of lack have ended and say my days of abundance are here come on this is God's word to you say my days of abundance are here I want to prophesy to some people that believe that this next year is going to be your best money year ever. Not just because you're saying it, because you're going to do some things differently. Say, I believe that. So here's my challenge to you. Here's my challenge to you. Now, practically, I want to say this to you. At Harvest, your faithful giving empowers your church to reach people you may never speak to and never meet, but that your giving has changed their lives. And when you stand in front of God, he's going to read you a list of people that didn't commit suicide, people that didn't become a statistic, the people who gave their lives to Jesus, He's going to say, this is what your faithful giving did practically for people beyond you. But here's, here's the challenge for the week. Say, what's the challenge? For your money to be better in 2017, your mindset has to be better than 2016. So first, if you're not a faithful giver, start giving faithfully now. You've seen the verses. You've read it for yourself. Either God's word is right or it's not. So either you're going to believe it or you're not. Okay? okay. But Bishop, I'm just struggling. With, mm, either you believe it or you don't. Say, so either I believe it or I don't. Okay, good. All right, so you know that. Now, uh, so if you're not a faithful giver, I want to challenge you to start today. Here's the second part of the challenge. I want everyone to get that book, Getting Your Finances in Order. Let me be very clear. It doesn't benefit me or profit me at all. I'm going to be very clear about that. I don't have any hidden agenda in getting you the book other than you need the principles. Get the book, Getting Your Finances in Order, and read it. And if you've read it, read it again. Why, Bishop? To prepare for 2017. Now, why am I teaching about money as we're ending this year? Because that's one of the areas. Now, again, if it's your first time, you'll think, oh, he just preached about money the whole time. This is one message, okay? So one message, yes, it is about money, okay? All right, but don't go off talking about it. All he talked about was money. This one message is about money. So next week, if I preach about relationships, what are you going to say? He just talks about relationships all the time, okay? It's one message. But this message is so important because I don't know about you. Maybe you're doing phenomenal financially. You can do better. Maybe you're doing great with your money. It could be better. Anybody want to see some greater progress in your money? Great. Okay. So, so, so that's why this is a challenge, and that's why I'm preaching about this because of how much emphasis the Bible gives it. So that's the challenge. If you're not a faithful giver, I challenge you to start today. Number two, I challenge you to get that book. If you're watching on a digital campus, you can get it in an online bookstore. You can get the digital download right now and read that book. I was talking to somebody uh, earlier this week, and we were talking about a situation that they had going on in their life, and we were talking about it. I said, well, did you read the book? And they said, well, I read part of it. I said, well, had you read all of it, that decision you made, you wouldn't have made. And I said, now you've got a mess to clean up financially that had you read the book, you wouldn't be in. So I encourage you, there's principles in there that come right out of God's word that are going to help you. And again, even if you're doing phenomenal financially, you can always do better. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, say, say I will not live in lack another day of my life. That's not my portion. I choose to believe God's word. He gets excited and he's happy when I'm doing well. So I want to make him happy. I choose to do well. Would you give him praise if you believe that today, church? Now, listen, today, if you're in this worship experience, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, there's good news for you. 2,000 years ago, God died. He stepped in our place so that we could have life and life more abundantly. No, it's not limited to money, but it's certainly part of it. What good is money if you don't have peace? What good is money if you don't like yourself? What good is money if you got low self-esteem? What good is money if all these other areas are out of alignment? So don't get the message twisted. Don't mishear anything I said today. This is not a message about being materialistic. It was a, money, a message to just help us realize that the Bible talks a lot about this issue. So we in the church should talk a lot about this issue. The scripture says that 
the number one reason people cite for divorce is because of money issues. I submit to you it's not money issues that are the problem. It's the lack of money issues that are the problem. But here's the reality. Somebody say reality. Jesus died not just for that part of your life, but that you would have zoe. It's the Greek word for life. Life and life more abundantly. That's what he died for. And I don't know about you. I get one shot. And I'm going to make that shot matter. So today, if you've never become a Christian, today is your opportunity. Second, if you've given your life to Jesus, but you've not been faithful to it, there's forgiveness for you. I don't care what mistakes you've made. I don't care what failures you've had. You know what? At Harvest, we're going to love you and love you to life. We're not going to beat you up. We're not going to judge you. We're not going to throw you down. Why? Because God still has a plan because you still have a pulse. Did you hear what I just said? His plan has not stopped because you still have a pulse. I don't care what failures you've made, what mistakes you've made, we all have. And today, if you need to become a Christian and recommit yourself to Jesus at Harvest, we're not going to judge you. We're going to love you and love you to life. On the count of three, we're at, if you're here at a physical campus or watching on any digital campus, on the count of three, I want you to throw your hands up. And when you do, we're going to shout and celebrate for you because we were all one standing in that same place. You need to become a Christian and recommit yourself to Jesus. If you're not sure, be sure today. There's nothing wrong with being sure. On the count of three, throw that hand up. One, two, three. If that's you, throw that hand up. Wherever you're at, I see you. Oh, come on, Harvest. Thank God for every hand that we can see. Let's thank God for the heart hands we can't see on every digital campus today. I want everybody to lay your hands on yourself. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for giving your life so that I can have life and life more abundantly. In the name of Jesus, I declare that you came, lived, and died so that I could live and bring heaven to earth. It matters that I was born. It matters that I'm alive. And in the name of Jesus, this is my first time praying this. I am now a Christian. If I was far from you, I am recommitted and reconnected to you. Great days aren't to come. They are here in Jesus' name. Amen. Harvest, would you thank God for every decision just made? If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or you just recommitted yourself to Jesus, take out your mobile phone, text the word decision to the phone number 59769. We're going to send you a text right away that's going to give you a free message and some other information that's going to help you to make Christianity your lifestyle and not just a hobby. I know you're already seated, but would you just give a quick side hug to your neighbor on your left and your right and just tell them 2017 is going to be your best money year ever, your best money year ever. Don't be materialistic, but it is going to be your best money year ever. Let's watch this. If you just made a decision to become a Christian, or recommit yourself to Jesus, text the word DECISION to 59769, and we'll send you a text with a message from our bishop called, What Next? To practically teach you how to make Christianity your lifestyle and not just a hobby. We are all about people, so let's praise God and celebrate the number of changed lives through decisions made to become a Christian or recommit their lives to Jesus last week. If you're at a physical campus, if you haven't already, please fill out a giving envelope now from the seat pocket in front of you or that was on your seat. The large envelope is for your tithes, offerings, and first fruits, and the other is for love offerings to our bishop. You can always give at the iPad kiosk at the giving receptacles throughout the campus. At physical and digital campuses, you can also give 24 hours a day and seven days a week through our mobile app or online at www at harvestcc.me forward slash give. You'll receive a confirmation email that shows you how your giving is changing lives. The best way to faithfully give your tithes, offerings, and first fruits is auto give, and you can set auto give up in three easy steps. Step one, log in and create an account at harvestcc.me forward slash give. Step two, select my donations, and step three, set up a recurring donation. Keep sharing your praise reports on our website or social media pages of great things happening in your life to encourage others and listen to this praise report about how when they started to give faithfully, how their life changed. Shalom, Bishop. On Wednesday, not too long ago, we were told to pray a bold prayer and sow a seed of $100. That night, I prayed that I would receive an increase in my annual salary of $10,000. I thank God every single day.